praise the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good and He's above all things. His love endures forever. So sing praise.
talk about it in his last little while, talking about this guy named Saul who ended up becoming king of Israel. How about it? Throughout all of this, like when I started the first message three weeks ago, I told you from the beginning, the title of that message was Set Up for Success. How God, God desires, and He does. He sets us up for success. He, that is His desire. His desire for Saul was for Saul to be a successful king. God did not make a mistake. He, uh, uh, he, you know, he, he wasn't uh, trying to be cruel to Saul because God literally set him up for success. The same thing He does for us. Remember, I, I, over the last several weeks, I've showed this to you how, because what, what, what did God do for Saul? He did these three things for him. So first, when he was anointed, when Saul was anointed, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. In other words, God let him know he wasn't in this alone. He had duty him with power for that time and for what needed to be done. And then second, he transformed him. He becomes a new person. God literally gave, the Bible tells us, that God gave Saul a new heart. He changed his heart that day. He changed it. So, same thing when we come to Christ, right? When we believe in Christ, what does the Bible say? If anyone believe in Christ, they are what? A new creation. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Oh, he's given us a new life, a new heart. He's, he's done this. And then, the third thing he says is the same that tells you, whatever job you're given to do, do it, God is with you. God promises, and Christ promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. So, God, as we go through all of this, understand, understand Foremost above everything else I've been talking about, God set him up to succeed. God desired for him to succeed. God desires for us to succeed. He does. But here's the thing. Will you trust him and believe in him to where you allow what he does in your life to take you down that road? And as we have been discovered with Saul, we found out, you know, Saul, he started out okay. He started out right. But over the past two weeks, we looked at the thoughts of squandered success and lost success. And as we discussed, discovered, Saul started out right, but all too soon, the position and the power of being king started to go to his head. Saul found out that his kingly dynasty would not last and that God would reject him. And it all happened because of his growing arrogance and pride. And in a second here, I'm going to read a portion of Scripture that we were mainly talking about last week. But we're going to see today the result of Saul's unwillingness to be obedient to God and to realign his heart with God as we look at this thought here, from success to madness. And as I go through this series of messages on Saul, please understand me this morning. I'm trying to tell you, avoid this road. I'm trying to show you what happened in the life of an individual that, that, that the Bible tells us about, where if, if, we, if we allow ourselves to, we can learn from his mistakes and hopefully, don't go that way, hopefully decide to say, Lord, let a light bulb go off in my head to where I don't decide to walk down the road that Saul went down. But unfortunately, too many people, too many Christians walk down the road of Saul. And later on, I'll sort of show you how sometimes Saul made the some degree made me thought he was okay. What he, what, 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 but again, he went from success to madness. As we were ending the message last week talking about lost success, and in that whole situation about Saul going to do the Lord's will, what God told him to do against the nation of Amalek, against the Amalekites, these words are uttered to Saul. It says, But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, or your obedience to His voice? Obedience is far better than sacrifice. Listening to Him is far better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as bad as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. And like I said last week, you, you, would, you would think, you would think that once that was uttered to Saul, that Saul all of a sudden, something would have went off in his brain and he would say, I'm, I'm going down the wrong road and I need to change what I'm doing. 
But I'm going to look and see what literally happens. And, and as we know, that didn't happen to Saul. It got to a place where Saul was just worried about what the outward appearance was. How people perceived him. He wanted to put on he wanted to put on the outward persona that he was the Lord's anointed. He wanted to put on an outward persona that, that God was with him. When he walked away from the heart that God gave, that changed him. He, he turned away from what God was doing in his life. And today we're going to look at the results of that, what happened. In the following chapter, you know, after that was said to, uh, to Saul by Samuel, the following chapter starts out where God tells Samuel to go to a town called Bethlehem to anoint a king there. And uh, we're not dealing with that today, but next week we're going to start picking up on a guy named David. Today, you know, over the last four weeks I've been telling you about, don't be like Saul. But starting next week, I'm going to tell you, God sets you up for success, and I'm going to tell you how you can be successful and following the Lord. And you can find that through the life of David. There's many others in the Bible too, but we're going to focus on the life of David. But today I'm going to end with talking about Saul. And again, and what happened to Saul? Saul, Saul again, God set Saul up for all of his success. God set him up. But because, like I said, because of his stubbornness, because of his arrogance, because of his refusal to be obedient, we heard what Samuel said to him, but then also we read this. In chapter 16, verse 14, it says this. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul. And God did what? He took his anointing and spirit off of him. And earlier we found out when we talked this whole thing, what was it? God, when he was anointed, God placed his spirit on him. But now we read, Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Now listen to me, folks. As a child of God, now I, as a child of God here this morning, now I'm not telling you you always have to walk around with a smile on your face. I'm not telling you like I've told you before. You know, if you're, if you're out there doing some work and you smash your finger with a hammer, and someone goes, "Oh, praise Jesus!" I want to slap him in the face because that's that that's faith. I'm sorry. I mean, honestly, if you're that happy, God kill you, and take you to heaven. You don't belong here on earth. But also, I'm not saying you don't sit there and cuss either. But you hey, if you smash your thumb, what are you going to do? Say, ow, that hurt. I, I, share, I shared this, you know, a little while ago about how, you know, uh, Charlie and I were building a deck at our house uh, in Easton. By the way, we sold all that. We settled it. We went to settlement on Thursday. It's gone. We know. We, I praise God. Yeah. But we were building a deck. We're, we're, we're nailing in some nails. On the thing I'm doing, I get down to the last two nails. I've already done probably about 20 plus nails. We're going to get this one area. I mainly use screws because, again, if you use screws, you're going to avoid smashing your finger with a hammer. Okay? <laughs> but in this one thing, we were using nails. I'm down to the last two. I'm getting ready to nail in. So the second to the last, I rear back and I smash my thumb. And, and all of a sudden, a thought went off my head that hurt. <laughs> And I said, ow, that hurt. And you know, started to do this. So again, it was sort of throbbing throughout the day, and it was sort of sore. I go back down the next day to finish up on something, and I, I decided to change enough, and I'm going to use some nails. This Now, this day, I, since I'm using some nails again, I'm, I'm using, I'm, I've already nailed in probably about 80 to 100 nails. I get down to the last two again. <laughs> last two, I had two left. Two left. Second to the last nail, I rear back and hit my thumb. Guess what? In the same spot. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I, I held it. I put that as an said, Dear Lord Jesus. I said, That hurts. I said, I would love if you just heal that thing right now. I mean, I'm sitting there. I'm holding my thumb. I'm like, Oh, Lord, right now. Lord, I want a supernatural healing in Jesus' name. <laughs> but, I was. I wasn't saying, oh Lord, thank you so much for me allowing me to smash my thumb. Shut up. <laughs> Be real, okay? Be real. Be real. <laughs> but Saul was just worried about what it looked like on the outside. And, and you know, and uh, and he allowed this this tormenting spirit to come upon God allowed it. And I was saying, as, as a believer, I'm not telling you to walk around me phony. But if the Spirit of God dwells in you, when, when, when some tragedy happens, you need to understand this. 
Your strength and your hope is in the Lord. No matter what the situation is, your hope and your strength is in the Lord. And, and whenever this type of stuff comes up, we need to review because that's the enemy trying to distill your joy, distill the peace that you have in God, and we need to understand who we are in Him and walk in that. But, but Saul here, he finds himself in a situation because he, he continually refused to be obedient. God removes his spirit and God allows a spirit of depression and fear and torment to come upon him. I'm here to tell you, none of that is of the Lord. And if you're dealing with that, you need to start seeking God's face because that is not of God. Because here's the thing. When this happened to Saul, all of a sudden, some things truly begin to change even more so in his life. But let's continue to read here. In verse 15 it says, And some of Saul's servants said to him, A tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music, and you will be well again. All right, Saul said, Find someone who plays well and bring him here. One of the servants said to Saul, One of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented heart player. Not only that, he is a brave warrior, a man of war, and has good judgment. He is also a fine-looking young man, and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, Send your son David the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul, along with a young goat, a donkey loaded with bread, and, wine, and a, and a wineskin full of wine. So David went to Saul and began serving him. Now this I have it highlighted there. Saul loved David very much. And so much so that David became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent word to Jesse asking, Please let David remain in my service, for I am very pleased with him. And whenever a tormenting spirit of God troubled Saul, David would play the harp, then Saul would feel better, and the tormenting spirit would go away. I mean, thinking, you know, you can think, imagine the type of talent that David had. But of course, if you read the Psalms, you sort of know. Read the Psalms they did. I can imagine, again, I, I'm, I'm throwing this in there because no one ever read this in there. But just imagine if um, this, this spirit of depression and fear would be coming to Saul. And David used to play his harp. And we know David wrote Psalms, so I'm sure he sang. Imagine, just, as a person this morning, he just needed to sit there and play. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have need in thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Imagine if David was singing that. Could you imagine it's truly the calmness that would come? On Saul, because Saul began to understand that God is in control of things. No wonder it soothed Saul's mind. Again, and let, me, let, me, let me give you a little, a little hint here, guys. If you're going through some struggling times, instead of going to the world to try to find your answer, try to find the appeasement that you need, try putting on some worship music. Try to get your mind focused on the Lord. Stop going back to, 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 to something that can't truly give you hope and get your mind on focus on the one who is hope. I'm telling you, it will change your whole circumstance. It will change your whole outlook. See, the problem is when people start to deal with fear and depression, they start running to the thing that drags them deeper into it instead of going to the one who can pull them out of it. So Saul, people at least around Saul were smart enough to know, hey, let's get a godly person around him. Because what they, they knew David was that way because the Lord is with him. And as David played, all of a sudden, Calm has become on Saul. And we see there that Saul loved David very much. And David became his armorer, which was a very, very trusted position. But as you heard, when the tormenting spirit came upon Saul, filled him with depression and fear, David would play that all of a sudden it would be relieved. But Saul's refusal to be obedient to God was the very reason why Saul was in this condition. It's the very reason why Saul was in this place, because Saul refused to listen. Saul, it all became about Saul, not about him. Like I said, if you again notice what is said in verse 21, that he loved David very much. 
But not, but not too far in the future, things are about to change. As we will see, Saul finds himself in a state of constant torment, paranoia, distrust, suspicion about his own son, but especially about David. After the defeat of Goliath, this is what we read. In Samuel 18, verses 5 through 9, it says, Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. Do you want to know why? Because God was with him. So Saul made David a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by, by the people and Saul's officers alike. So David, when well, he showed himself to be a very, very capable leader, a capable warrior, a very loyal and faithful warrior, because everyone what they welcomed it, that they liked what was happening. And when the victory, and when the victorious Israelite army was returning home, returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. What is this, he said? They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. So Saul went from what? Loving David very much to all of a sudden have a jealous eye on David. See, instead of Saul, see, if Saul would have truly had the Spirit of God upon him, he would have realized this was the hand of the Lord blessing the nation of Israel. But it, but it got to the point, it wasn't about the nation. It was about him. About, oh, poor old me, oh, my. Have you ever been around people that no matter what the situation is, it could be someone else going through something, and they turn it around to get pity for themselves. That's Saul. That's the spirit of Saul. We need to understand it's not about us, and that's the problem. All Saul could see was me, 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 me. He got to a place where, again, where after that one battle, he, won, he, set, he set up a memorial for himself. A monument for himself. It wasn't about worship. He did that first before he decided to go worship God. And all that happened because he wasn't obedient. His heart was turning from God. And because of that, he begins to find himself going down a road that, that, that he tries to hide it, but it comes out. He sees this. He sees how God is blessing him. And by this time, the Spirit of the Lord has already removed off of him. And God's anointing gets in place upon David. And, and David is, is, a, is a guy who's pursuing the heart of God. And David's very, very successful in battle. And everything that he does, he's successful. And Saul knows that Saul was okay with that as long as Saul was getting praise. But when all of a sudden, David started to get some praise, Saul became very jealous and very angry. And we need to be careful that we ourselves don't find ourselves. When all of a sudden God begins to bless somebody else, all of a sudden we begin to be mad and jealous over God blessing them. Because honestly, you don't know what they may have been through to get where they are. You need to be concerned about your relationship with God. Forget about them. As far as that type of aspect. But all Saul could do was just focus on, on this and begin to truly turn. It, it, this jealousy turned very, very ugly. Because right after this we read in verses 9 through 12, I mean 10 through 12 it says, the very next day a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul and he began to rave in his house like a madman. Hence I said from success to madness. David was playing the harp as he did each day. But Saul had a spear in his hand. Usually what happened, we know when David played it soothed Saul. But Saul, he allowed... See, at first, when it first happened, when, when David first played, Saul had a love for David. But jealousy all of a sudden came in. He was eyeing David a completely different way. So David was playing the harp as he did each day. 
But Saul had a spear in his hand. And he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. And my thing is, he was going to kill him. Simply because he was jealous. This spirit got on him so bad that, they, that he was ready to bring detrimental harm to a guy that all he did was, was faithful for his king. All he did was be faithful for his nation. And the king, because he felt threatened or because he made up something in his mind, because he imagined something going on that wasn't happening, he decides he's going to try to kill this guy. So, so he intended to pin David to the wall, but David escaped him twice. And I thought, said, David, how dumb are you to go back in there a second time? But this happened two times. This started getting home Saul so much that a second time he turns it in. And then it says, Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. Saul was going to realize, he thought, you know, I'll get rid of this threat. And when he couldn't, and he tried again and couldn't, Saul got scared. He got even more paranoid. And also going to drive him down the road. That I think, in all honesty, if he could, if he could have stepped back and really looked at it, probably said, how in the world did I get here? But unfortunately, we never read that he ever got to that place. There were several times that, that, that he had a chance to sort of reflect, and for a very short period of time, he would symbolically change, but he really didn't. Because here, because here's uh, here's what we read. I said, you know, you know, I said, here's David. David's faithful, but he was crazy, right? But that's not all. That's not all Saul did. We we read in just these two chapters, in chapter eighteen and chapter nineteen, and there's a lot more that happens after that. Here's what we read: When all this stuff begins happening, when, when Saul becomes jealous of David, again we see where he tried it two times, tried to kill him with a spear in this one situation, in this one portion here. Saul makes David the commander of a thousand. In other words, he took him out from being the, the overall leader to where he just knocked him down to a thousand, hoping that he'll be killed in battle. When he realized that God was with him, he says, you know, let me not put my hands upon him, but let the Philistine armies kill him so, so that, that my hands are innocent of his blood. Even though he's trying to set David up for death. But David, what? He's successful. He's successful in what he does. Saul offers his oldest daughter, Mirab, to David, if he will fight the Lord's battle like a valiant man. So other words, he's trying to bribe him to do even more dangerous things. Again, hoping that the enemy would destroy him but what does he do? He's successful. But he Saul doesn't let her marry someone else. But then David offers his daughter Michelle to him and offers David for a hundred Philistine foreskins. So what does David do? He goes out and his neighbor's chest. He gives him two hundred. More, more than what's needed. He gets to a point that Saul orders Jonathan and his servants to kill David. In other words, they're telling him, seek out, you know, when you get a chance, strike David down. And Jonathan basically, uh-uh, it ain't, ain't gonna happen. You know? Saul slings his spear at David again. Saul sends messengers to David's house during the night to try to kill him. And again, David hasn't done anything to do. Everything of this is happening because of this tormenting spirit that's come, become, that has come upon Saul and this jealousy that he's allowed. I'm telling you, you better get a handle on jealousy, folks. Because if not, it's going to take you down the road you don't want to go down. You better get a handle on envy. It's going to take you down the road when we go down. Because you can see what, 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 what is happening. He says, and then, and, then, and then also it says, Saul sent three groups of men to, 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 to nail, to take David. And then when they were unsuccessful, he comes himself. And I'm going to read that little portion of Scripture to you. Because I'm going to understand how God steps in here. In verses 23 to 24, it says, And finally Saul himself went to Ram Ramah and, and arrived at the great well in Siku. State the Police Credit Union. There we go. You didn't know it was in the Bible, did you? Where are Samuel and David, he demanded. They are at Naoth in Ramah, someone told him. But on the way to Naoth in Ramah, the Spirit of God came, came even upon Saul, and he too began to prophesy all the way to Naoth. Now listen to this. Now again, this goes to show that, that, that he really wasn't right in his mind. Because when God does something, what does it? He always does it in DC order. So, so in a way, Saul was still trying to resist. But God wouldn't let him go any further than a certain thing. Because listen to what it says here. He tore off his clothes 
and lay naked on the ground all day and all night prophesying in the presence of Samuel. So the Spirit of God comes upon him to, to, to stop him and arrest him. And the people were watching and exclaimed, what, is even Saul a prophet? Now again, this isn't the first time he said that. So because when Saul was first, when God first anointed him, when he was anointed king, and the Spirit came upon him, when Saul got around the prophets, what did he do? He prophesied. But at that time, he truly had a changed heart. Here, we see he's prophesying. In other words, because he knows what it was like to feel the Holy Spirit come upon him, when he got around, it was very easy for him to walk in that way. The difference was when Saul got done, he didn't leave change. Even though he prophesied all day and all night, he did not allow what was happening to him to change his heart again. He refused to stay stubborn. That's why sometimes you can see people who are fighting in their walk with God, being stubborn against God, who at one time a day were living right from him, can come to an altar, all of a sudden speak in tongues and everything else, and leave this place be the same person because they never truly give the heart of God. And they do that because they know how to function in the moving of the Spirit. It's all they're not moving the function in the Spirit. But it did not change it. Again, you would, you would think, you would think, after this kind of encounter with God, surely, 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 Saul's heart would be changed. I mean, hey, you prophesy all day and all night. Hey, any of you, if you've ever been, been lost in the Spirit, you know, where, where all of a sudden you've been in an altar, whether it's at home or in church or whatever, and the power of God just falls so heavily upon you, and when you're done, you get up and you think maybe ten minutes have passed, you look down and three hours is gone. Who's been there? Amen. Huh. I mean, the, 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 there's nothing like truly being in the presence of the Lord that way. And Saul finds himself in the presence of the Lord this way, but the problem is it didn't change him. God just used to stop him from pursuing David. And again, in all of this, David did the wrong. David didn't give him a reason to even feel this way. Saul got upset over just one song. One song. One song. David's killed his 10,000. Saw his thousands. He got mad, got upset, and all of a sudden allowed jealousy to come into his life. And everything you read about David, he, David, David would look, he honored him like crazy. It's almost like David almost went out of his way to make sure that, that, that he did not offend Saul. But in chapter 20, I'm not going to read any of this. Saul not only continues to try to put David to death, but he throws his spear at Jonathan for defending David and calls him the son of a, basically calls him the son of a whore. Paul calls him wife a whore because he was mad. In chapter 22, Saul kills Ahimelech and his father's entire household except one. And then annihilates those living in the town of, of Nod, the city of the priests, because David just simply visited there. He accused them of being cahoots with him to try to take the kingdom. So Saul goes in and destroys a family of priests. God's anointed and called family to work in, 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 in the, in the, around the, 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 the uh, Ark of God. The Ark of the Covenant. He destroys them. So you begin to see that what began to happen in Saul's life. See, in his twisted state of mind, Saul's best allies are considered his enemies. His most faithful people are considered enemies of his. And his enemies become his allies and try to put David out to try to be killed by the Philistines. Saul becomes a very paranoid man. He fears his most faithful servant, David, who will, not even put to, who will not even put his king to death, even though when it seems like that God is delivering him into his hands. There were two times when David's out there and Saul's chasing him all over the nation of Israel. And David's hiding. He's running. He, he's trying to well, first, what did I do? And you know, he's asking him, what did I do? You know, if I'm worthy of death, I'm not afraid to die. But what did I do? And, so, and again, all of this goes back to Saul said over Saul. 
Over a song. Over a song! Stupid, right? Stupid, right? You ready for me to go to boom on me? How much have I got in anger or somebody or something stupid is that too? But pastor, you don't understand. I don't care. You need to get right with God. God can take care of the situation. Because if not, you're going to find yourself in the night of soul. Become super paranoid and everything else. I mean, David said two times there was a situation that David could have killed Saul. Because it literally looked like the doubt was put, because his memory would tell him, Look, David, the Lord, the Lord and again, like they're trying to make it spiritual. The Lord, the Lord has put your enemy right before you. See, they're telling him that Saul is his enemy. You know, the, the, the Lord's put, put your enemy before you. You, you, you can kill him. See, God's living to your hands. And another time, when, when he heard the one response, because David says, you, David says, God forbid that I lay my hands upon the Lord's anointed. Even though God took his anointing off Saul, God still, David still respected Saul as being the king of Israel. He may not agree with everything he was doing, but he respected him as being the king. And he said, I'm not going to lay my hands on If anybody takes him down, it's going to be God. So, so the second time, his men said, they realized that David's not going to do it. He said, well, David, give us permission all I need is one time. I'll strike him one time. And that's all I need. And I'll take care of your enemy for you. David says, no. God forbid that I should lay my hands upon the Lord's anointing. Again, if he dies, he's going to die by the hand of God in battle or something. So, so David just constantly refused And both times, David let Saul know, I could have killed you, but I did. And all of a sudden, Saul said, very, very, you know, for a very short time, well, David, thank you that, that my life was, you know, uh, precious in your eyes. True. And he says, I was wrong. But you know what happened? He didn't think about the song again. And he went after David again. He allowed jealousy to come in and just literally just wreak havoc in the and paranoia and grab a hold of much places. See, at first Saul tried to hide it, but then he just goes all out. And openly, he shows people he intends to kill David. And anyone who got in his way was in trouble. Hence why I was telling you about the town of Mount. I mean, he, he, he went after people. After a guy who was faithful. See, can you go see what can happen is if, if you're not careful? And again, hopefully, again, I'm trying to tell you about this. People say, well, well, Pastor, you know, that was in the Old Testament. We had Jesus in number, but the thing is, I've already tried to show you correlations how this stuff works. But if you keep on trying, trying to, to resist what God's doing, you know, keep on trying to fight against the, the Spirit of God and when He's trying to move your heart one way or another, I'm telling you, you're walking down the dangerous road. And that's what this, this whole thing is that, to help you understand. Take warning about this. Be, be, be aware of this. Because, again, all of this happens simply because. Saul had a con he was constantly refusing to be obedient to God. But with that being said, it does not change the fact that initially, that initially, God set him up for success. And that's what God has set us up for success. You know, there can come a time where, as the New Testament, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can resist so much. But God will just turn you over to whatever fancies you want to do. And all the while, you may think you're okay, but you come in and you feel the, you know, since you feel the presence of the Lord, oh, I'm okay. Huh. Wrong. Unless your life shows what that presence of the Lord is doing in you and showing that you live for God, I don't care what you say, what you do, what type of tongues you speak in, you're not serving him. <coughs> I'm just trying to clear you. Do not go down the same road that Saul did. But let each and every one of us truly pursue God with everything that is in us. Let us pursue His heart with all of our mind, our soul, our heart, and our strength. Let us not trade success for madness. Let us truly learn from the lesson of Saul. In a minute, I'm going to call the musicians up. But I'm going to close with this. You know, I've been, we've been in each message with this thought. 
I ask the question at the close of each service during the series. I ask, Pastor, what does it have to do with me? So I'm asking you again. So I'm asking you again. How important is obedience? We already read what Samuel said the song. And you know how I ended the message the last several weeks if you were here. But I'm not going that particular route this morning. I'm going to go to something again that Jesus said. Here's what Jesus says on the subject. In John 14, verse 15, he says, If you love me, do, what, do whatever you want. If you love me, you're cool to go, whatever you want to do. What does it say to me? If you love me, obey my commandments. What does it say? Obey. If you love me, <coughs> obey. Obey my commandments. Then he says in verses 23 and 24, he says, And Jesus replied, listen, all who love me will do what I say. All who love me will do what I, what I say. My Father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Now listen, verse 24. Anyone who does not love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. So if he's saying, what am I even telling you now? I'm not telling you by myself or of myself. My words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. But, but he correlates what? Obedience to what? To love. And love to obedience. Oh, I believe in Jesus. And if I really want to be blunt about it with some people, I'd like to tell them, no, you don't. Well, how do you know? Because of the life you live. Or what I, I should say, or what I see outwardly the life that you live. You don't know the Lord. You don't believe in Jesus. Because if you did, your life would be different. You may know a little bit about him and a little bit of him, but, 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 but you don't believe in him. Because when the Bible talks about belief, it's always belief in action. In living. In doing. And you show up by how you live. You don't love him because if you did, you would show. Because even Christ himself, he, 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 he compares love to obedience. So how important is obedience? Jesus equates whether you love him or not through your obedience or lack thereof. And I ask this one question to end today. Would Jesus say you love him or not? What would Jesus say about your life? Would he say that you love him? Only you can answer that. What would Jesus say about your life? Because again, God has set us up to be successful. When we, when we, begin, to have, when we begin to have a faith in Jesus Christ, he sets us up to be successful. He allows the Spirit to come upon us. He gives us a new heart. And He promises He will always be with us. But it's up to us to continue to walk in that life. Saul, if he would have listened, because remember, the message I preached last week, God told Samuel, once again, he wouldn't obey me. Once again, he wouldn't listen. Please don't let God say that about you. That once again, he or she won't listen. Because there can come a place where God will do to you what he did to Saul. And remove his spirit from you. And basically say, tell the enemy, have at it. Have at it. I'm removing my anointing. And I pray, and I truly pray, none of us ever get there. But there's a danger in constantly refusing to listen to God. To obey his voice. To listen to the Holy Spirit. There's a danger. <coughs> I would rather as much more sincerely focus on what we talked about in the first message of this. That God sets us up for success. 
but we also need to deal with the realities of things. And God allowed us to share these messages for a reason, to bring some warning to the church. Bring a warning to the church. Bring a warning to you. Don't go the road of salt. Because it's a road you don't want to go down, and it may be a road you won't recover from. And God is pleading with his people through his church. Because again, Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. If we love him, we're going to do what he says. We're going to live like him. We're going to live that life with the brothers. Amen. I'm asking musicians to come. We've ended this service every week so far with this song. Because this is the key to it all. And again, learn from the life of Saul. But I don't want you to leave this place being downtrodden or depressed. Because the whole thing was, was to try to speak words of life to you. And to help you understand that God loves you. He does have, to have an awesome plan and purpose for your life. He truly does set you up for success. But in order to be successful in this, we have to be obedient. As I started next week, we're going to talk about the life of David. And how David was successful in everything he did simply because, as I try to get throughout all of this, it seems like over the last several years we've been dealt with a lot. Because he allowed his heart to stay changed. He allowed his heart to pursue the heart of God. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. That's what this song is all about. Lord, give me a pure heart. Give me a pure heart. A heart that hides your word. A heart that looks towards you. A heart, Lord, that's undivided. Lord, a heart that you rule and reign. A heart that needs compassion like our Lord's compassion. Stop it.